Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension files on the Wetterly investigation. Unlike most press conferences, the brief statement is made and then questions taken. I propose to do a PowerPoint presentation of the case focused primarily on the first few months of the investigation. The reason for the PowerPoint presentation is the sheer size of this investigation. If you have questions about a specific slide, please make note of it and we'll go back to it in the question answer portion. I would ask then you refrain from asking any questions until I have concluded the presentation in final statement. Following press conference, we will give you a flash drive of the files, the PowerPoint, the opening, and final statements. After you've had a chance to digest the files on the flash drive, we believe that you will find the most important information is in the first part of the files where the investigation went off the rails. We will cover that part of the case extensively here today. We have all had the advantage of knowing the ending from the beginning in perhaps the most famous murder mystery in the history of Minnesota. I understand that, and so do each of you. On the other hand, you will not have a good or complete understanding of the case since by court order, we are prohibited from releasing the FBI files. The practical result is that citizens will not know about the consequential, some consequential events in the Wetterling case. I would never presume to do this. Uh, on the other hand, what qualifications do I have in order to speak about this file? I'm a graduate of Concordia Moorhead. I have a BA degree in biology. I'm a graduate of the Detroit Police Academy. I was a police officer in two inner city neighborhoods in the, history of the city of Detroit. I spent 10 months in the serology and trace evidence section of the crime lab focusing primarily on homicide. I was an original member of the Homicide Squad 7. There were eight squads in Detroit Homicide. Squads 1 through 5 did general assignment. Squad 6 did narcotic assassination, drive-by shooting. Squad 7, the squad I was a member of, it was a new squad, did only robbery, rape, and burglary murders. Squad 8 did police shooting. Detroit had over 800 homicide investigations in 1975. Our squad cleared nearly 80% of the 125 cases we investigated in 1975. 100 of those would have been, as we would call, fresh cases. We usually get two fresh killings a week. And since we didn't have enough to do, the commander assigned us 25 cold cases. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal and Parade Magazine featured our squad in 1975 for our clearance rate. I'm a graduate of the Illinois Bureau of Investigation Academy. I was a special agent assigned for the homicide squad in the city of Chicago. A special agent assigned later to the Cook County Organized Crime Homicide Task Force investigating mafia assassinations. I was a uh, sheriff of my home county, Bill Moore. Police Chief City of Lakeville, Sheriff of Dakota County, Sheriff of Steele County, Police Chief City of Faribault, and the Sheriff of Stearns County since May 2017. The only thing that's important about that, I've had no unsolved homicides under my watch. The place to start in our discussion on how the Jacob Wetterly investigation was conducted is not October 22, 1989, the date of Jacob's abduction, but January 13, 1989. It starts with the kidnapping and sexual assault of a 12-year-old Cold Spring boy. January 13, 1989, the boy was wearing a snowmobile suit and was walking home from the side cafe in Cold Spring about 9.45 p.m. When he was approached by a man who pulled up and asked where Kramer lives. No, Kramer's lived in Cold Spring in this area, which would indicate the perpetrator was likely a local person. 
It also tells the victim following the assault as an appointment at the red carpet bar in St. Cloud, which should also seem to indicate he is local. After the boy approached the car, the man exited the car, grabbed him, and threw him in the back seat of the car and said, I have a gun. Don't try me. The lad gave descriptions of the car descriptions to Deputy Hessian, who said it smelled like a new car. It was light blue and bucket seats made of cloth. Dark leather straps along the edges of the seat. A blue strap running from the center of the seat. A luggage rack. Seat belts which automatically came on. Child safety locks and a transmission on the steering column. He described the perpetrator as wearing camouflage fatigue. Dark gray zipper type vest. Brown baseball cap. <coughs> thick eyebrows. Wide eyes. Fat nose. Possibly a mustache rough, dark skin, skin slightly wrinkled, broad shoulders, husky build, very deep voice, and ears that slightly stuck out. On January 14th and the next day, Chief Investigator Pierce takes additional descriptors of the perpetrator. White male with dark skin, five foot seven, five foot eight, broad shoulders, 170 pounds with a small gut. Ears that stuck out, Larger nose, brown eyes, not wearing glasses, aged somewhere between 30 and 40, green camouflage army fatigue, shirt and pants, possibly a gray colored vest, brown baseball cap with lettering on it, black army boots, talked in a deep voice, bottom row of teeth were crooked somewhat in a military style watch on his left wrist. Culture and voice description goes on to say, it was a portable radio, which was wrapped in gray duct tape sitting on the front passenger seat. The radio had an antenna on it. He heard a short bit of radio traffic, Pacific, in male and female's voice prior to the subject, turning the radio off. Obviously, a portable police scanner. Following kidnapping of the cold spring boy, the perpetrator drove in circles and backwards for a little bit. Here's right. Exaggerated turns and trying to confuse him to the Pacific location. After the assault, the suspect tells the cold spring boy, you're lucky to be alive. Start running, keep running, to run or he would shoot him. Suspect keeps the cold spring boy's jeans and underwear. These are trophies. Now, on January 16th, Pierce writes, Officer Ziegelman contacted this writer by telephone. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated he had information regarding a possible suspect in the assault of the Cold Spring Bowl. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated Danny Heinrich. That's a 1987 Mercury four-door Minnesota license. 086 Charles Edward Z. According to Officer Ziegelmeyer, Danny Heinrich's 87 Mercury has a light blue interior. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated Danny Heinrich does know is often accompanied by Dwayne Hart. Dwayne Hart will become important as this investigation unfolds. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated Daniel Heinrich is currently either in the National Guard or Army Reserve and is seen on a regular basis in part in military fatigues. Pierce checks out Heinrich's employment in the National Guard and determines what type of military gear and clothing would have been available. Pierce and Detective Leland spot Heinrich's vehicle parked and unattended in a driveway at Heinrich's father's home south of Painesville. They appear to dismiss Heinrich as a suspect based on a few discrepancies in the Cold Spring Boys' description of the suspect vehicle on Heinrich's vehicle, specifically because the vehicle did not have automatic seat belts and the transmission was on the council. On Pierce's January 16 report, as of this date and time, officers have not interviewed Danny Heinrich regarding this matter. Very shortly after, on January 18, an unsolicited, the boy tells Pierce he was mistaken and that the vehicle did not have automatic seat belts and the transmission was not on the steering column, but was on the counter. The boy described the vehicle as having a luggage rack. However, it did not. 
the investigation of sexual assault and culture and avoid then turns to other sex offenders. The boy also is subjected to numerous additional interviews and photo lineups. They do not check out Dwayne Dewey Harper. There is no mention in the file about other assaults of young boys in Painesville in the preceding years, even though it is clear that the Painesville Police Chief was talked to on February 10, 1989, as part of this investigation. Now we turn to Jacob Wetterling of Dutch. October 22, 1989, at approximately 9.15 p.m., a masked subject approaches three juvenile males, Aaron Larson, Trevor Wetterling, and Jacob Wetterling, near the address of 297 4891st Avenue in St. Joseph Township. The masked male subject abducts Jacob Wetterling. Tracks and footprints are found in the area of the abduction scene. And on the left, we see the <coughs> tracks at the scene of the abduction. Two days later, they are identified as Sears Super Guard radios. You will notice plaster casts are being made of those tire prints. On the right, adult footprints, along with what is believed to be mixed in with Nike foot footprints worn by Jacob Weather. <coughs> Trevor Weather gives a description of the perpetrator. Five foot ten, wearing dark colored clothes, Nylon stocking over his face, armed with a handgun. Aaron Larson's description of the perpetrator. Wearing dark clothes, boots and gloves which are colored black, five foot nine. Voice was rough, and it sounded like he had a cold when he talked. He said, I got a gun, but the fight's in the ditch. Recall, cold stream boy, I have a gun. Don't try anything. Perpetrator orders Aaron to run towards the woods. Perpetrator orders Trevor to run as fast as you can through the woods. Cold string abduction, you recall. After the assault, suspect tells the cold string boy, you're lucky to be alive. Start running, keep running. To run or he will shoot. The Wetterling abduction is Chief Investigator Pierce. He responds to the Wetterling home at 11 p.m. on October 22nd and takes statements from Trevor and Aaron. Deputy Ziegler meets him actually at the driveway. He's already at the Wetterling home. <coughs> Later, he accompanies Pierce to a local motel. Then to the town found to identify the two clerks who were working that night. Deputy Ziegler and home to a neighborhood sur survey on October 23rd to check in 22 homes. It is unclear when on the 23rd the survey was conducted at 10 of the homes that it's noted. Nobody at home. Six more homes were checked by Deputy Lee. The first mention of the Cold Spring abduction and assault is on November 30th, 1989, in an interview with Cold Spring victim and his parents. Essentially, the task force has been spinning its wheels since October 22nd. Heinrich is interviewed on December 12th, and the deputy detective observes that his vehicle has Sears Super Guard radios. It should be noted that in reports by officers, dozens and dozens of reports that they dismiss potential suspects because they do not have clear <coughs> super guard radios on their vehicles. Only one other mention I found in thousands of pages of reports of Sears super guard radios that they were on a disabled vehicle a station. Henrik also wears camouflage clothing or army boots when he's not on National Guard duty. In Pierce's report, when, I'm sorry, he denies wearing camouflage clothing or army boots when he is not a National Guard duty. In Pierce's report, when Heinrich is listed as a suspect in Cold Spring kidnapping, it states, Heinrich is seen on a regular basis in military fatigues. On December 16, 1989, a teletype from the task force concluded that two abductions are believed to be the same. Now we turn to the Painesville incidents. <coughs> From August 1986 to late autumn 1988, there are eight incidents involving juvenile boys who were assaulted. There were seven victims. One boy was victimized twice, and there were two additional juveniles who were witnesses to the assault. <coughs> Incident number one, August 1986, juvenile male knocked off his bicycle. White male, five foot nine, mud-like substance on his face. Struck. 
the man and he fled. No. Heinrich is in the military and would have known how to use mud or face paint as a disguise. Second incident, August 21st, 1986, two juvenile males leave a pizza place. One juvenile male was attacked by a man, described as five foot six, five foot eight, in long sleeve sweater and gloves. Juvenile was struck in the back of the head and knocked to the ground. Suspect groped the juvenile's front pockets. As the second juvenile approached, the man fled. Incident three, November 30th, 1986. Heavy set male wearing nylon windbreaker comes out of the bushes, puts his hand over the juvenile male's mouth, drags it into the tree. Suspect said, shut up or I'll kill you. Voice was described as low, static, filled. Suspect drove the jewel of genitals over and under his clothing. Took stocking cap and cut off a piece of his hair with a jagged knife. Again, trophies. <coughs> Told the victim after the assault, keep laying down for five minutes, I'll blow your head off. Asked the juvenile's name and age. Incident four, February 14, 1987. Juvenile male was attacked in the stairwell of an apartment by a heavy set male, five foot six, dark colored cloak and jacket, mask covered his face, spoke in a deep, low whisper. Suspect threw victim down the stairs, victim screamed, victim was told to be quiet or he would be killed. Suspect groped the victim over his clothing, asked what grade the victim was in, took the victim's wallet, obviously not an armed robbery, but again, trophy told victim not to move or he would be killed. Incident five, May 17th, 1987. Previous bit, an incident for knock off his bicycle. Pudgy male, dark looking face, dark clothing. Suspect broke the juvenile's genital area. Victim screamed and the sus screamed that the suspect had already gotten him. Suspect fled on foot, leaving behind a baseball cap. Incident number six, September 20th, 1987. Two juveniles were approached by a chubby male, five foot seven, five foot eight, short, chubby legs. Face was either painted or he wore a mask. As the juveniles saw the suspect approach, they screamed and ran. Incident number seven, summer of 1988. <coughs> group, of group of juveniles were camping. One juvenile was attacked by a white male, husky bill, raspy voice. He wore pantyhose over his face. Colin Webb wore pantyhose over his face. He wore camel colored pants, green army type jacket, black boots, gloves. Suspect sat on the juvenile and held a small knife to his throat. When the juvenile screamed, the suspect said, shut up or I'll kill you. The juvenile fought back and escaped. Incident number three, you recall, shut up or I'll kill you. Incident number eight, <clears throat> late fall of 1988, a juvenile male was delivering newspapers. So, suspect knocked the juvenile off his bike and fled. Possibly wearing a ski mask, dark colored stocking hat, black shirt, black pants, black gloves. In the Wetterling abduction. On October 24, 1989 at 3.40 p.m. Less than 48 hours after the Wetterling abduction, a victim in the Paintsville incident appears at the sheriff's office and talks to Benton County Deputy Tice, who is assigned to the task force. He speculates that the incident in Paintsville are connected to the Wetterling abduction because the way it was done, quick, military, and proficient. He tells the deputy about incidents and states he saw two of the ambushes by the Painesville perpetrator. He also gives the name of the Painesville officer assigned to the cases and state a hat was left at the scene by a perpetrator. It is January 5th, 1990, before this lead sheet is checked out by a St. Cloud officer assigned to the task force. On January 8th, 1990, Painesville Police Chief was interviewed and says, Painesville has experienced approximately one year of episodes, and he believes that Danny Hyman, who is in the National Guard, should be considered a suspect in the molestations. On January 10th, the Sheriff's Office reports Sergeant Nome 
who's working with an FBI agent, interviews Danny Heinrich about the Wetterling kidnapping and writes, it should be noted that Mr. Heinrich bears a strong resemblance to the artist's conception of the abductor in the Cold Spring incident involving again being redacted. He is also about the same physical size and commented in our interview that he's a member of the National Guard of Rome. Here we take a look at the composite done by the Cold Spring Board. And we can look at Heinrich in life in 1990. No. As a result of the interviews of the Painsville victim, the task force appears to be focusing on Dwayne Hart, not Danny Heinrich. On January 12th, a report written by Sheriff's Detective Munn <coughs> states that a polygraph examination was given to Danny Heinrich by an FBI agent, and Heinrich registered deceptive on all questions pertaining to the kidnapping of the Cold Spring Boy and Jacob Lennon. Heinrich tells officers he feels the reason he failed the polygraph examination is that he was nervous. Every person who's ever taken a polygraph examination is nervous. Also on January 12, 1990, Heinrich's 1982 40 XP two-door, blue in color, was photographed by a sheriff's investigator and an FBI agent. Quoting from Detective Munn's report of January 12. Photographs were taken of the tires which were consistent with those tires found at the scene, wetter by gross tread design. And here we see those tires, <coughs> Sears, SuperGuard, and Radios. No. Detective Munn is called to the Wetterling abduction on the night of October 22nd. He is the detective who takes the plaster cast of the tires and the footprints left at the scene. Also, and again, quoting from Detective Munn's report, it should be noted that during the interview, writer observed Mr. Heinrich's soles of his shoes, found them to be consistent with the footprint pattern found at the scene of the Wetterling abduction. And here we see Heinrich's shoes. And here we see the bottom of those shoes and a footprint from the scene. <coughs> On January 12, 1990, Danny Heinrich's shoes are sent to the FBI lab. Analysis later indicates that Heinrich's right shoe and the right shoe imprint corresponded in design. On January 12, 1990, it is decided that Heinrich will be placed under surveillance. Pierce, again, and Detective Olson start surveillance on the 12th, recording from their report. 35 hours. Subject Heinrich left the apartment, entered his vehicle, proceeded south on Highway 124, and then doubled back. Proceeded east on Highway 23, turned into Painesville Industrial Park, and doubled back from that location. Subject proceeded east on Highway 55, south on Highway 4, and County Road 20. Subject then doubled back and proceeded back west on Highway 55. 2055. Subject turned right out to 116th Street, 2590, which would be the number of the detective following him, picked up surveillance. Subject turned his lights on and was lost. No. In the Cold Spring case, following kidnapping the Cold Spring boy, the perpetrator drove in circles and backwards for a little bit. Here's right. Exaggerated turns and was trying to confuse him to the Pacific location. On January 14th, 1990 surveillance report says that Heinrich makes apparent evasive moves and then drives the rural dirt roads. No. His actions certainly should have set off alarm bells since an innocent man would be unlikely to take driving maneuvers to escape the surveillance. It appears Heinrich is under surveillance for parts of three years. On January 15, 1990, Detective Olson an FBI agent arranged to take the tires off Heinrich's vehicle and vacuum the interior of the car. Background information on Heinrich is run by interviewing co-workers and acquaintances. This work is done by sheriff's investigators and FBI. On January 16, 1990, Detective Olson's report states he receives a copy of Danny Heinrich's DWI arrest from 1986 in the city of Painesville by a Painesville officer who confiscated 
a battery operated police scanner, which was cooked up, hooked up to a cigarette lighter charging system. We would call it called Springboard. Portable radio, which was wrapped in great duct tape, sitting on the front passenger seat. On January 16, 1990, a vehicle a blue 1987 Commodore <coughs> Mercury Topaz repossessed by the bank from Heinrich was located in Princeton. You recall the Colts and Boyd saying the vehicle had child safety locks on your left, child safety locks. And he said the transmission was on the center console on your right. Colts and Boyd is brought to the vehicle and says he feels his vehicle is similar to the vehicle he was abducted in, and the boy felt the seat and stated the rear seat feels like the seat of the vehicle in which he was abducted. The boy viewed the interior of the vehicle and stated after viewing the interior, he would not change anything on this vehicle. This officer then asked the boy on a scale of one to 10, the number one being this vehicle being the least <coughs> like the vehicle which he was abducted and 10 being the most like the vehicle which he was abducted for the boy to rate this vehicle. The boy advised his officer on a scale of 1 to 10, he would rate this vehicle an 8, or possibly 9, as this vehicle being similar to the vehicle in which he was abducted. In a statement to a head of the detective, the Cold Spring boy says, he, did, he then said this man ordered him to pull up his underwear and jeans without touching his butt to the back seat covers. Obviously, Danny Heinrich was worried about seminal fluid stains in the car. At this time, the vehicle should have been black lighted for seminal fluid stains in the car. It was not. A resident of the part where Danny Heinrich lives says he does, does wear camouflage clothing, such as a fuel jacket and hat around town, along with army pants and boots. Danny Heinrich earlier denies he ever wears military clothing and boots when he's not at work. Obviously, a lot. At the same time, in subsequent days, backgrounds are being run. Wayne Park. On January 23rd, 1990, a search warrant was executed by the FBI and the Sheriff's Office at Danny Heinrich's father's residence in Paysville. They confiscate from left to right black army boots, camouflage pants and shirts, two police scanners with a scanner book which had detailed police channels and a zip vest. This vest was never shown as far as reports indicate to the Cold Spring victim. Recall, Cold Spring Boyd said the perpetrators wear a zipper vest. All of the items taken in the search warrant, including the vest, were released back to Heinrich at the direction of the county attorney's office, February 8, 1991. Noted. During the search, photographs from a locked trunk were noted. A male child coming out of a shower with a towel, again, a locked trunk. A towel wrapped around a male child in his underwear. Three fully clothed children. Danny Heinrich objects to the confiscation of these photos, stating they just don't look right. Inexplicably, they are not confiscated. No, Heinrich maintains the children are named Murr, and he obtained them when he was at the Wilmer Regional Treatment Center. Mm -hmm. On the 29th, that no children or family named Worm had any association with the treatment center, but the family was located, and they did know the Heinrich family. On January 25th, 1990, Heinrich is interviewed by an FBI agent in Sheriff's Detail. He tells him he had burned the photos of the Worm children because they looked bad, and they were no kind of pictures to have anyway. No. Danny Heinrich says he chewed tobacco for many years and has noted that his bottom teeth had black spots on the front. Recall, James Wilkesville, Cold Spring Boy, the bottom row of teeth were crooked somewhat. In the report, the Cold Spring Boy describes them as cheese teeth. Think Swiss cheese. On January 24th, Heinrich appears at the Sheriff's office and inquires of the disposition of his tires. Sheriff's Detective Olson asks if he would submit to a physical lineup, and Heinrich says he would not unless a court order directed him to and after he had consulted with an attorney. Carpet and fiber samples from Heinrich's car, the Mercury Topaz, were given to the FBI January 25th, 1990. January 26, 1990, Heinrich is in a physical lineup which he consents to. 
He, of course, is on the far left. Two young men view him in the lineup according to sheriff's reports. In the week prior to the weather the kidnapping, these two young men view a suspicious person in car in the area where Jacob was kidnapped. We found this particularly odd. It's a week before a suspicious person, even if you would have picked him out, which he didn't, they did not, what difference could it possibly have made to the investigation? In the lineup on January 26, 1990, the Cold Spring Boy does not pick out Danny Kramer. In Detective Olson's report, he writes, this officer has victim to give a clear mental picture of the individual assault on January 13, 89. He indicated that he did not really have a clear picture at this time and that, and that as time has gone by, it has got less and less clear. Detective Olson writes, when asked to rate Danny Heinrich on a scale of 1 to 10, as far as similarity, the person who assaulted him, the victim gave Mr. Heinrich a 4. According to the Wetterland Production and Physical lineups of Heinrich should have been planned prior to this line. All of the victims from Painesville, nine young men, should have been part of this line, as well as Aaron Larson and Trevor Wetterland should have also been involved in this line. They do not employ a voice lineup, making their participants in the lineup say out loud words that were used during the two abductions or in the Painesville incidents. For instance, I have a gun, I'm going to try and get the F in the car. Do it, or I'm going to shoot you. You're lucky to be alive. Keep on running. Don't look back, or I'll shoot you. I'll find you after school and I'll kill you. Shut up, or I'll kill you. Lay down here for five minutes. If you don't, I'll blow your head off. On February 7, 1990, appears at the sheriff's office, demanding his property back. According to the report written by Detective Moore, Mr. Heinrich was upset with officers inquiring from friends and relatives whether or not he is a homosexual. Mr. Heinrich indicated he was going to place an end to this investigation or should be of him and sue the county and the FBI. Heinrich is arrested the evening of February 9, 1990 by Cerns County detectives in a bar in Roscoe. Roscoe is a small city in Cerns County. My detectives tell me he's been drinking. In fact, one of my retired detectives characterized him as being drunk. Detective Olson states Heinrich is interrogated by FBI agents at the Stearns County Sheriff's Office, and Heinrich demands to know if he is under arrest. You know, planning of the time, place of an arrest sometimes is the most important part of an investigation. One would never willingly arrest someone drunk at not late at night. That is a serious mistake. Heinrich is told he's being arrested on local charges of kidnapping and molesting the Cold Spring Boy. He was officially placed under arrest by Detectives Pierce and Olson from the Sheriff's Office. Heinrich states emphatically he was not guilty of this crime. He's being frank. Heinrich maintains he is innocent and calls the charges. And yes. The interrogation of Heinrich by FBI agents is monitored according to retired Stearns County detective by agents from the Behavioral Science Unit I'm profile of the FBI National Academy in Virginia. The file does not indicate that the profilers wrote a report about this interrogation. However, a retired Stearns County detective I have interviewed states profiles tell officers that they don't believe I did the crimes. We regard the interrogation as perhaps the most fatal flaw in the Wetterling investigation. Why? One of the agents who interviewed Heinrich was fresh out of the academy and perhaps had never interviewed a crime suspect in his life. Second agent interviewing Heinrich may or may not have ever interviewed a homicide suspect. Meanwhile, the BCA, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension had supplied their most experienced agents to this case and they were experienced homicide special agents. And I'm going to give their names. Denny Deer, Gary Sigafos, Joel Cahoon, Don Tweedy, Everett Doolittle, Denny Owens, 
These are the agents that have taught almost every officer in this state about how to investigate homicides, whether in college, university, or with BCA training. They were, they were kept, according to those agents, at more than arm's length away from this investigation, running meaningless leads. There is no one in the Sheriff's Office with extensive homicide investigation experience. The FBI are not trained homicide investigators. An FBI agent writes on the Cerns County Sheriff's Office Supplemental Report, February 9, 1990. The information provided to Garber was that the FBI lab had made a positive match between the fiber taken from the carpet of Danny Heinrich's former vehicle, a 1987 Mercury Topaz, and a fiber found on the victim, the Cold Spring Boy snowmobile suit. And this writer was not to inform anyone the about the match. No. FBI agent Al Garber is the Wetterling Task Force commander. On February 9, 1990, booking card shows that Heinrich has been arrested for first degree criminal sexual conduct, kidnapping, and then the notation for at least for county attorney Pat Stone. There is no mention of Heinrich filing his release until background investigations are noted in March and April 1990. First mention of the Minnesota BCA having anything to do with Heinrich is on April 23rd, 1990, when a BCA agent and a sheriff's detective interview a man who knew Heinrich. Approximately one week from April into May 1990, 10 background investigations of Heinrich are conducted. It is October 1990 before another mention is made of Heinrich. Here you'll see three slides. Very important, going from left to right. Take a look at number one. <coughs> the Painesville incidents and all of the descriptors. If you go down there, and white male going on down. All right, now go to the Cold Spring abduction, and you can transfer some of the descriptors from number incident one to number two, specifically white male, five foot seven, five foot eight, broad shoulders, husky build, 170 pounds with a small gut, very deep voice, dark gray, zipper type vest, camouflage with teeth. Now, take the first descriptor from Painesville, second descriptor from Cold Spring, and go to the Wetterling abduction. And we have, again, all filled out, male, five foot nine, five foot 10, approximately 180 pounds, Nylon stocking over his face, dark coat, dark pants, black boots, black gloves, a low rough voice as if he had a cold and he asked the boys how old they were. One thing is missing. Armed with a handgun. I'm going to find that handgun for you in a few moments. Now, let's look at Heinrich in person. When you look at, remember number two, and we'll go back to it on the next slide. We look at him in person. Brown eyes, wide eyes, thick eyebrows, fat nose, not wearing glasses, ears slightly stuck up, 30 to 40 years of age. He is not. He's actually younger than that, but as you can see, appears older. The back mature military member. Now, let's go back to the three slides. Everything is filled in except a few minor things. Color of a baseball cap, not on the <coughs> stocking cap, possibly a mustache. And he may have picked up the Cold Spring Boy when he had not shaved for days. We don't know that. Rough dark skin, and again, on for the hand. In March 1991, Special Agent Al Garber and the Department of Corrections investigator interviewed Dwayne Hart at a Minnesota correctional facility. Hart is a convicted sex offender from Painesville, who is a groomer of young boys who he abuses while Danny Heinrich ambushes and takes trophies from his victims. And think of those trophies. Suspect kept Cold Spring Boy's jeans and underwear, took stocking cap, cut off a piece of his hair with a jagged knife. Suspect took victim's wallet. There appears in this entire file a misunderstanding on the part of almost all the investigators, certainly, which continues way into 2014. The difference between a groomer, think of the incidents we've just been reading about in Pennsylvania, and someone who ambushes and attacks. They don't do, predators do the same thing over and over again. 
Hart also was a friend of Danny Heinrich's brother, David. Hart tells Gart in this interview that in the fall or summer of 1989, he was in Danny Heinrich's apartment in Painesville observing a black ninja type suit next to Heinrich's bed. Recall, Painesville. Painesville victim said, perpetrator was wearing black shirt, black pants. Hart tells Garber that Heinrich shows him a dark blue pistol. Garber Weatherly and Aaron Larson see a hand. Here, folks, this is our hand. Hart sees two police scanners, one is gray in color. Holstering boy in his statement to Pierce says he observed what appears to be a portable radio, which is wrapped in gray duct tape, sitting on the front passenger seat. On the evening Heinrich, Hart was visiting Heinrich. Heinrich was upset about losing his job at finger. No. Heinrich's last hit finger up, which was located near St. Joseph, was in Cobray, 1989. He was unemployed until November 12, 1989. Heinrich asked Hart how to get rid of a body, asking if putting a body down a well or in a river would be the best way. Hart tells him, body down a well will stink and that a body in the river will float. This is in October 1989. Hart then tells him we'd better get rid of a body by putting it under plastic at a sewage treatment plant. Both Hart and Heinrich work building sewage treatment plants. In fact, right across the road from where Jacob is initially buried is a road called the Sewage Pond Road. Hart says his purpose in speaking to Agent Garber is that Hart is suspected of kidnapping Jacob Wetterling and he wanted to provide information regarding Heinrich which may be helpful to the others. In a second interview with Garber at a Minnesota Correctional Facility in October 1991, Hart said he thinks the person who kidnapped Jacob Wetterling was a loner and a construction worker who was working in St. Joseph area at the time of the abduction. Figure out it is three and a half miles on the scene of Jacob's abduction. Sergeant Bulls, U.S. Army National Guard said of Heinrich, he's always by himself. Peter Lauer, who lived in the Plaza Hotel, where Heinrich lived, he's alone. Heinrich's brother Dave described Danny as being pretty much of a loner. Hart said again, the abductor had a ninja suit. Remember again the Painesville case, black shirt, black pants. He said the abductor lives in the vicinity of St. Joseph and Painesville and described the kidnapper as being good at covering his ass. Hart said authorities had spoken to him, the suspect. For a second, Hart tells Garber that the child abductor and culture carried a police raid. Hart said he believed a blue car was used in the sexual assault of children near Painesville. We have no evidence that any car was used in the, the assaults in Painesville, however, both abductions were done in a blue car. Here's a critical question. What happened to this information? Based on the reading of the file, it's not apparent that any follow-up was done on this information. There is no mention of Heinrich in the files for more than 20 years. <laughs> on July 18, 2012, a DNA profile was so obtained from the Cold Spring Boys still in the field and sweatshirt. Note on the left where they cut out the spot where they got the DNA evidence. And on March 5th, 2015, DNA results come from the hat. From the hat come back to three individuals. On May 12, 2015, from hairs from Danny Heim, taken voluntarily from him on January 12, 1990, are being suitable for nuclear DNA testing. On July 12th. 2015, the lab report states the predominant male DNA profile matches Dan James Heinz. No, the ad comes back at 80.5% match. The Heinrich, obviously, two other people have worn that hat. From there, a search warrant is submitted. On July 27, 2015, by Detective Colonel of the Stearns County Sheriff's Office for Heinrich's home in Annandale. Jacob Butterling's remains are found and removed at a farm site near Painesville, September 7, 2016. We would like to recap why Heinrich should have been considered the main suspect. He was in the military worth camel around Painesville. He lies. He says he never does that. 
In the military, he would have learned to use mud or face paint to disguise himself. Mercury Topaz used in the Colts Ring abduction matches the description given by the Colts Ring boy and the boy rates it an eight or nine out of 10 to be the car he was kidnapped. A fiber found on the Cold Spring Boy snowmobile suit is consistent with fibers found in Heinrich's Mercury Tokens. The Sears Super Guard radios map tire prints left at the weathering scene. Suspects are most often eliminated precisely because they do not have the tires. He has the tires. The shoe prints correspond to the shoe prints at the weathering scene mixed in with Nike shoe prints worn by Jacob Weather. He has the shoes. It is a detective who spots this, who takes the cast, and knows these prints better than any other officers. He fails a polygraph examination given by an FBI agent as to whether he was involved with either Colts Ring abduction or the Weatherly kidnapping. He has photos of children seen during the search warrant in his possession and lies how he obtained them and who they are. He has no known adult girlfriends or adult boyfriends. He has a portable police scan mentioned by the Cold Spring Boy and confiscated an earlier DWI arrest. The search warrant and as seen by Dwayne Hart. He uses every means to evade the surveillance of officers and agents. In two assaults, he asks victims age and grade, pain smoke, and weather. All across each of the three cases, he says the same types of things. His voice is described by multiple victims as deep, raspy, and very distinct. Wayne Hart describes a black ninja suit described by the Painsville victim. He has the handgun as seen by Dwayne Hart. In the same month where he loses his job, and when he kidnaps and kills Jacob Wetterling, he asks Dwayne Hart how to get rid of a body. His overall physical description fits Painsville, Cold Spring, and Wetterling cases. He fits the composite almost to a T. We're going to end the PowerPoint presentation. I want to give you some few more additional impressions and thoughts. The FBI is called in on October 22nd. They are a national police investigative unit and even an international investigative unit. They start wide and then focus in. In the first week, a lead is run in California. By the second week, leads are run in five per month in North Dakota. In essence, Sheriff Charlie Gregg has already lost control of his own investigation. This should not have happened. Local law enforcement, on the other hand, focus in and then gradually move out, much like a pebble thrown into a pond. We have made the case perpetrator was a local person. Stress and anxiety put us into television. My lieutenant in Detroit homicide, Larry Kelly, used to say, the light at the end of the tunnel, people, is a train coming straight at you. The answer is right here. Now we know, and it frankly should have been known from the onset of the letter and abduction, that the light was not at the end of the tunnel. It was right here. I mean, how many other boys were abducted in Stearns County? Well, there was one, the Cold Spring Boy. An investigator should have been on that in mere moments after Jacob was taken. How many other boys were assaulted in Stearns County? Well, there were seven. They were in Pains, where Danny Heinrich lived, were ultimately where Jacob Wetterling was assaulted and murdered. In the flash drive of all the Stearns County Sheriff's Office and Minnesota DCA reports, you'll notice gaps. The reason for the gaps is because the FBI is essentially running the case right up to and immediately following the initial arrest of Danny Heine. We also say that you know your investigation is already off the rails when you're dealing with psychics. October 24th, less than 48 hours after the abduction. There was a lot of contact with psychics in this case. They are rough about precisely nothing. Investigators are also dealing with Psychics before an excellent neighborhood canvas is ever done. There are also clairvoyants, tarot cards, Indian medicine men, witching rods, Satanists, voodoo, witchcraft, hypnosis, premonitions, and dreams and repressed memory reports in the file. 
There are thousands of pages that are necessary, redundant, detailed, and ultimately meaningless reports about trivia, like the kind of pizza ordered movies watched, <coughs> or large amounts of toilet tissue boarded. The reports have been described as more detailed versions of who didn't do it. There are huge wastes of time and manpower, particularly in the beginning. Essentially, there was a lot of manpower. Most of it was squandered. The task force pretty much checked out every sex offender in Minnesota, and a large number of sex offenders in North and South Dakota, Iowa, and Canada. On the other hand, checking out exposers, peeping tongues, male and female attacks, cross-dressers, people incarcerated in civil war at the time of the abduction, someone who died two years ago, and men in their 70s and 80s was clearly a waste of resources. In the second week, for instance, an eight-year-old man was checked out in Vermont. But a report, less than 48 hours after Jacob's abduction from a Painesville victim, telling a task force deputy that the Painesville cases and Jacob's case was perpetrated by the same person because it was quick, military, and proficient. The tip was followed up on January 4th, more than two months after it was received. The young man's assessment. Absolutely spot on. However, these leads were followed up. Owns a baker and is weird. A paraplegic, drunks, described weirdos, the mentally challenged and ill, a 350-pound man, domestic assault perpetrators, delusional loners, a small child's drawing, incest with a female, and a man with a piercing stare. There are multiple cars checked out and composites brought tips in from throughout America, much less possible sightings of Jacob in Minnesota, surrounding states, and across the country. And by June of 1990, Heinrich is essentially forgotten and there is a fixation on over-the-road truckers. The inherent problem of task force is that it's hard to overcome the trust factor. By that we mean Detective and agents are mixed as partners with people they've never worked with prior. So agents with sheriff's detectives or detectives with BCA agents, all of whom have different educational background and training. Working with a longtime partner who knows your job, your style, your type of question, and someone you can buy and bounce ideas off is good. As a detective, you have to learn to fight your bias. And it's often done through arguments. Task forces, in our view, follow group behavior. And when it goes wrong, it really goes wrong. It is unwillingness to see you're on the wrong path. And in short order, this task force was not just on the wrong path, but on the wrong freeway, and later on the Autobahn with no speed limit. In this case, to make cooks spoil the broth, the soup, the stew, or in Minnesota, the casting. Investigators need to be up to date on the investigation. According to retired de detectives, that didn't happen. Task force investigators were off work for a few days had no way of updating themselves when they came back to work. The right hand literally did not know what the left hand was doing. There are huge time gaps between interview, investigation, dictation, and transcription, sometimes more than a month on important reports like search warrants. These time gaps are most prevalent in FBI reports. There's probably no bigger stress for investigating the abduction of a child. We do a cost-benefit analysis, which in essence, we know the child we never got to experience in life. And there's fear on the part of investigators and certainly citizens. We can't change what's happened, but we can learn. Deputies who work here are not here at We've assigned a permanent a lieutenant to be in charge of investigations or to detect the need at all deaths. We've also extended them as detectives on in four years. They were transferred out after a four-year period in the past. During my tenure, we have assisted the uh, Wake Park Police Department with a narcotics-related homicide, Painesville Police Department, with the double killing of two elderly people in each instance. Sheriff's deputies working as a team, 
local police, DCA brought the case to a successful conclusion. Suspects arrested for jail. In close the case of the 2012 shooting death of Officer Tom Decker, which mm -hmm. solved the arson case of the St. Mary's Catholic Church in Melrose, a case that multiple agencies had investigated over a two year period. We're taking a hard look at all our unsolved cases. I detected this in the sign to review these cases. Take questions. Please identify yourself and where you're from. Uh, we can go in, a, I'm sure, in a very orderly manner. Uh, and then we can maybe, whether or not I should repeat your questions, but you tell me. Go ahead. Sir, sure, if I'm with Karen Levin News, Minneapolis. Uh, back to the, the decision to bring Heinrich in and arrest him and question him. Who, were, who made that decision and, uh, and, and what all went into that? Well, it's, unclear. it's unclear to me. If, you know, based on the reading, all I have is the reading of the reports. It obviously was a decision made by high level people in the task force um, after reviewing what then was the initial evidence in the case. Or does it indicate why there was not the charges weren't pursued after that? That has never been clear to any of us. Sheriff uh, Tom Hauser from uh, Five Eyewitness News. You talk about experienced, uh, thorough Minnesota BCA investigators being kept at arm's length by the FBI, was a lot of this the result of a turf battle between the FBI and state investigators and local? I don't want to ascribe motives. On the other hand, the FBI got leads. Leads were listed as A, B, C. A leads all went to the FBI, B and C leads went to the sheriff and to the BCA. And you think, the, and just as a quick follow-up, and the more experienced homicide investigators, in your view, were the state investigators. Well, there's no question about that. Every one of those investigators ex are experienced. In fact, I have worked homicides with some of those investigators all saw. Sheriff Richelson from Star Tribune. Um, back to the arrest. Was that the FBI that made that call? And you said it was, you would never arrest a suspect drunk and late at night, and why is that? Well, it's pretty hard to get a statement on it. Drunk people at all of my officers will tell you on a DWI arrest. And, uh, you know, again, I'm not sure who made the call to do it. My, it been my investigators who would have made the arrest on the other hand. It was uh, Pierce and Detective Olson who made that arrest. Chair, Paul Bloom with Fox 9 here. So you just uh, <clears throat> be curious, do you feel as you talk about the lessons learned that technology has solved some of those issues that modern day this type of um, mistake making would no longer occur just because of uh, what we have at our fingertips? Uh, certainly that, I think you can make a case for that. Obviously technology was not DNA back at that time. And now I mean, that even that has improved from mitochondrial DNA, nuclear DNA. Uh, in fact, they're doing DNA and putting out composites of people who left it's extraordinary. We're seeing older cases solved recently in the Twin Cities of a 30-year-old case solved with the use of DNA. On the other hand, you know, I was a homicide detective in Detroit 1974. We were solving cases left and right without the use of those kinds of things. And again, we were skilled when we had 800 murders a year. And just one more, and then a quick follow-up. It would appear to Wayne Hart. Do you, were there, were there other people in the community that, that uh, Danny ended up uh, confiding in in the last couple of years? Have you heard brothers, uh, anyone else, kind of kept this a secret, or was this really just one or two men? Uh, he, he was someone who did not tell anyone else. And I don't think he told Hart. Uh, what you have with Hart is two predators. And one predator has a good feel the other predator and that heart knows who he is he's a groomer he's someone who buys young people with uh, alcohol and marijuana baseball games fishing whatever typical groomer he's not that. he knows predators yes. yeah. in your review of all of these thousands of things could you talk about uh is that credible? I mean, is that, were there indications that he should be in The question's about Daniel Ressier. I can't, because that uh, is still an active uh, litigation, I cannot talk about that. Uh, 
uh, at this time. Thank you very much. Is there anything more specific that indicates, you know, when the DNA technology was available in 2015 to, to recheck Heinrich? Like, did somebody say, hey, we should go back and check that guy in particular? You know, that is uh, not clear to us based on the reports. Uh, who, who made the call to go back to Heinrich? Heinrich, though, should, was ne here's a question I would ask my retired detectives. Did you ever think of going back and taking a run at this guy? Answer no. Uh, it startled me a little bit. My view on that is, if I look at this entire file, what's the secret of the cold case? Read the reports. Read every bit of the report. Start from the beginning and read. I don't care how intimidating it is to go through tens of thousands of reports. Obviously, I did it along with other people on my staff. So you've got to start from the beginning. We got cold cases in the city of Detroit. The detective would typically go into the interview room, shut the door, and read, and come back. We got a cold case one morning by at a little bit after 8, by 11, we had the guy in custody on an armed robbery of a, a motel. Why? He read the report. And did you say that you actually did ask the retired detectives if they took another run at him and they told you no? I told, ask retired detectives, did you ever take a run at him? Why wouldn't you think of going back and taking a run at this guy? They all said no. Why? Yeah. They, they didn't give me a good explanation. And then obviously the, uh, the FBI did not also think of taking the run at But at some point, someone said, hey, when you go through this, you should have thought of it. It's, it's one of the things that has been described by a very fine attorney now, Judge, who said, when Heinrich comes, because the case is so big and they're so overwhelmed, it was like a whisper in the crowd. But you know what it should have been? A persistent whisper in the crowd. Sheriff Steven Cruzal, KMSI Radio. On the slide uh, that talked about the FBI and the, the fiber being a match and the FBI agent not wanting to share that with local <coughs> law enforcement, did it go, does the investigative file go into any further um, specific, 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 specifics on, on that? Um, why? Um, again, I would not like to ascribe uh, anybody's motives. I think it speaks for itself. Sure. Rob Wilson with Channel 9. Uh, uh, I keep going back to the tire print and the shoe prints. What is, in your view, the possibility of anybody else matching both of those? And why was that not such a, a, a screaming red flag? Yeah, it should have been obviously a very a big screaming red flag given the fact that they had, they had certainly eliminated dozens and dozens and dozens of suspects. When they would go and talk to a suspect at home, they would say, hey, 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 I want to see your cars. They'd go look at the cars. Now, all of a sudden, they find the tires. And then lift up your shoes. It's the shoes. It's... But it, there's more. Obviously, I went through around 20 things that made this gang high. And again, is it because they're overwhelmed? Is it too large? I can't count. The chances of anyone else matching both those? Pretty slim. Uh, not just slim, but yes. Sheriff, you talk about that victim showing up uh, within 48 hours of Jacob's abduction and talking about the blue cap. Is it fair to say that? all the information law enforcement needed was delivered to them within the first 48 hours? I think all the information that they needed was actually available to them on January 13th and 14th, 15th and 16th of 1989 with the Cold Spring case. Um, but in that case, uh, that is certainly a huge problem because this was a, a good tip but why wouldn't you have been curious? Well, what did go on down in Paintsville? You know, who's the officer? How come the cap was left? Let's see, you mean there were assaults in Paintsville? And yet they're checking out, in one instance, I made the mistake yesterday of reading some old files and getting them all spun up, as my people said, because they're checking out a guy at prison during the second week. Okay, he's been in prison at the time, but it's the third time detectives and checked him out in a two-week period. And I gave you the instances of the things they were checking out during this time. And yet that, I mean, how that is not an alien, right? 
it's assault. How that cannot be an alien is, uh, is beyond me. Sheriff, the, the FBI may listen to this and say to you, well, your hindsight is 2020. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, I think everybody in this room has uh, 2020 hindsight. But I, I don't want to get into a debate with the FBI about the truth. Um, I have laid out, I think, in a measured, clear, concise, and precise manner the way I saw it, based on the reading of the file. If they somehow would challenge my assessment, <coughs> release their files. They've got files, release them. And as a quick follow-up, there's been a lot of controversy about the release of these documents. Uh, do you think it's important that these have been made public so that we can dissect what happened? Uh, Justice Lewis Brandeis said years and years ago, he died in 1941, if I recall, said sunlight is the best disinfectant. And sunlight is the best disinfectant. On the other hand, our release of these files is done according to Minnesota state law and according to what the legislature has set down as what are data privacy issues. Some of those, in my view, and certainly on the part of the um, Wetterling family and also on the part of the Prince family, certainly need some adjustment in the upcoming legislative session. But Sheriff, sure, you're saying that you're pointing the finger at the FBI, but this victim walked into the Sheriff's Department within 48 hours. Why couldn't they? Why is that the FBI's fault that they didn't follow up on it? You uh, mischaracterized me, actually. I have not said that this was primarily the fault of the FBI. We certainly all uh, have responsibility and accountability for that. It was our investigators who were there. It's our investigation. Certainly we should have. Now, who was directing investigators at that time is uh, clearly the, the, the FBI. Uh, they were doing The FBI was directing all of the investigations and tips of that time. The uh, uh, 20 years that we say Hunter is being not here in the file, how do you that? Who bears responsibility for that information being lost? Well, you know, obviously uh, the majority of that blame would have to come back to uh, any of the people who were actively working on the case at that time. There was continued efforts on the part of uh, sheriff's investigators, certainly after 1990, all the way through. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 41,700 documents from us. Sheriff, can you talk about those FBI files? Have you seen those and what's in them? Is there anything that would maybe help explain some of them? Um, I have, uh, prior to the court order, the court order ordered me not to uh, comment about the FBI files specifically. Um, I have read all of the FBI files, not all of them, there's some that are so uh, meaningless that there was no sense for me to read them. Um, would, tell me the last part of that. Is there anything in that, that might help explain you know, some of these gaps? Well, you had said no. that a critical piece of the investigation was missing without the FBI files. It's certainly missing in terms of the day-to-day -day activities of the task force, and that you're going to see a big gap in there from uh, really from October 22nd through unless our officers were also with the FBI you are going to see gaps in uh, the investigation into how you're going to be able to understand it and I think the best thing to do here is you need to look at this and then you'll have a better feel for that. Uh, that's a little bit on you know there's some uh, debate on that, which I don't understand. Um, we we put out 41,787 pages. Um, our records are very clear, and I think they're accurate, and I'll stand up. They have 12,545 pages. They said they have only 4,000 pages. I hope that's not they're trying to lessen their involvement in this case. They have 12,500. 45 pages. Sure, if you talked a little bit about the turnover that existed, um, but later on, were all the guys that were there in 1989 gone by a certain point, and then and then the new guys didn't look back at Heinrich because they weren't involved in any of that? And I if anybody saw, at what point did that happen? 
you look at me, and I wouldn't have any way of knowing uh, since I've only been here since May. On the other hand, I think, and my senior staff believes, that most of that was done by word of mouth as opposed to reading the file. Sure. Back again to the first 48 hours, you said that the FBI was directing the investigation. What does that mean for those of us who don't work in law? Does that mean you couldn't follow up on this? No, they could have or? Obviously, they could have followed up on it and should have followed up on it. Uh, when the exact date, Ms. Wilson, when the exact date that the FBI essentially took over the investigation is not clear right away, but it's certainly going to be somewhere past 40, around 48 hours or just a little bit past. Sheriff, on the heels of why you felt it was necessary to do this today, um, you know, the PowerPoint, and make a rather uh, public display um, over this, uh, you know, many have said that this only re-victimizes the letter and the family. I'm just curious if you have a message to them today, um, or what you share with them in that. Well, I've had several conversations with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wetterling, my chief deputy, John Lentz has, my, one of my lieutenants, Lieutenant Hemish has, and again, to, you know, officer, offer our condolences and, and say that our wish was that this case would have turned out differently and better. Sure, if there was a strong evidence indicating primary advice, why law well, that's, you know, that's primarily a legal question for, uh, you know, for attorneys to answer, not for me. Uh, I would, you know, in Dakota County, they have the case of a young girl that was uh, taken and murdered, and her body never showed up, and they, they released that and they let that guy go. Without a body, I can tell you, you almost never get a conviction. And of course we had, and the Weatherly family obviously had an interest in bringing him on. Sure. Obviously we see this through sort of the eyes of the, the end of the case, as you mentioned. So Heinrich's in jail, he's surveilled. Are there other names in this document, in this uh, case dump where we'll see other, other potential suspects that got such close scrutiny, or is Heinrich kind of even alone is, is just the, the main local target? Uh, there's there are some other people who did get uh, a good look as well. And were those rightfully so? Like, and, and just in terms of you reading the report, or oh, this makes sense if these other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what? I mean, I don't know. Sheriff, we saw your extensive law enforcement history here. Can you give us a little more context for those of us not in this line of work? Most all cases, do they have to be much less? I didn't see more. Well, obviously, you know, I think convictions in Detroit was a lot less evidence than this. Sometimes, certainly today, the good question about the scientific evidence in today's world makes those cases, uh, there's a lot more to them. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I also know from experience is when someone's in custody, the case almost always gets better. That's just, that's just the way it works. And uh, you have a chance of making your case better when the person's off the street. And obviously that didn't happen. Well, you said, again, you said that interview when they arrested him, or you said that arrest was the fatal flaw. Again, can you explain, was it because he was drunk, or what, why was that the fatal flaw? Well, I, it's one of the fatal flaws. I think the lineup is almost equally at, uh, at fault. Uh, the flaw was they didn't plan the arrest out. They didn't have experienced homicide people doing the interrogation. Uh, you know, the profilers, according to my detectives, said he didn't do it. And that's why it seems to me that they go right off that. They go right from that. Uh, and again, right to over the road truckers. So they thought he was suspect. They didn't do much. They ran backgrounds on him uh, at some length. But those backgrounds were like the guy was applying for a job. But there was nothing in there that focused in on who he was, what he did, what he could have done, what kind of friends he had. It just was poorly done even after the background investigation. So was this investigation poorly done? Was it a failure up until <coughs> 25 years later? How would you characterize it? Went off the rails. Went off the rails and 
very quickly on, frankly, it went off the rails uh, with the Painesville incidents. Uh, we should have been involved in that and, and solved those cases way back in 87. And it goes off the rails again in 1989. And then I think it goes off the rails, certainly from October 22nd through the arrest and release of Danny Heine. So you're not pointing the finger at the FBI. This is a series of cascading failures by all levels of law enforcement. Well, of course it is. And I, and I will accept the responsibility, speaking for all of law enforcement in this case, I will accept the responsibility and accountability for this, that all of us fail. And how hard is that for you to take? You started with your your sheets. I mean, how? I, I, I guess I haven't thought about it. I, you know, I've read the files and uh, there Did you say your guys said you got all wrapped up or something? I, I did get a little spun up. On. There were times I will admit that we were putting together this PowerPoint. Uh, we, we were screaming at them, like, can't you see this? You know, and it was kind of tough. And even yesterday, actually, I'm reading late into 2014 files, and I'm still, what in the world? And then they said, you're done. You got to quit this. There's no one here. Everyone's gone. And I, you can't discipline someone for messing up an investigation. Shoot, it's 71 people shot in Chicago and six people murdered. And three weeks later, they had one person in custody. I mean, how's that? But then how do you make things better? Like if, if, if you can't discipline someone for well, I think you make things better by talking to the people who are currently working. You know, my staff has a very good understanding of this. You know, one of the messages from my detectives is, look, look at this. Do you want some dope like me 27 years later looking at your files? No, you don't. Do it right. Do it right the first time. You know, sometimes we're so close to the action, we lose the details. That's true with anyone. We're, we're just too close. And they have, in my view, on October 22nd, mistaken activity for accomplishment. They just felt like we keep doing this and keep doing this and keep doing this, getting more and more tips and county come. We'll eventually stumble onto it. They had it. So what kind of plans have been put in place to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again this year? Well, certainly there's been presentations made on the part of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and us to uh, law enforcement groups throughout the state uh, to talk about what, uh, what went wrong. And obviously in our own case, we've had three murders since I've been here all solved and other critical cases solved as well. And again, we never had a permanent uh, investigative supervisor uh, until I put someone back there. I sent all of my detectives to the death scenes. That was not done in the past. The Painesville incidents, um, you said it was the police chief. Was it, did he share that with the task force, uh, with the sheriff's office, or with everyone, or none? Uh, it's clear that he shared it with uh, task force officers um, about the incidents where Heinrich was listed as suspect. Sheriff Tim Venture from Channel 5. You said you're going to go back and look at other unsolved cases. Are we talking as far back as when this happened? Is it possible that other cases were as mishandled as this one appears to have been? There's cases from 1974. There's two young girls killed the Riker girls. That deserves a very good look. Um, there's an elderly woman in Southern County killed. That deserves another look. Um, we, have a, a miss, we have some missing. Th there are things that can be done. We've assigned one detective to each one of those cases. Obviously, their job is to read it from the beginning and see if we can do something with some of them. And you know, the point is, is the scientific evidence could it help us uh, solve some of those cases? Perhaps it can. On the other hand, you know, this is what we've been focusing in on uh, since uh, I got here in May of 1920. When did that process start? Before going back to look at it? Well, I'll be pretty soon after I got here. Is there a state behind the investigation from other times? No, I don't believe so. Um, I, you know, my own gut feeling as a long-time detective, there was probably some more incidents on the Paysville which were never reported by young people. 
I don't know how many. I just have a feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to uh, essentially instance, I think there's more down there. And we have no evidence. Yeah, and of course, you know, serious child pornography was he was involved in any other crimes afterwards. We have nothing that seems to indicate his MO, which we obviously know is pretty. You know what his MO is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sheriff, do you believe uh, Heinrich, or maybe you talk about what the Heinrich Bell Center is doing with his confession when he says? You know, that he was killed right away and that he had a body and then he moved the body. Do you believe that story? Do you really think that's the case? Yes. Yes, I think that is what he did. And I think that my belief in that would be shared by all of the NCAA agents who currently worked at and the FBI as well. But you know what? I know some of you are operating on a pretty strict deadline. Um, I appreciate you being here. Uh, uh, Mr. Waterman, uh, being here, and thank you for your attention. Hey, my name is Al Garber, and I was a task force commander. Could you could you step up where we can hear you, please? Yeah. Sheriff, do you mind? Can I use that podium? Can I use it? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I've known Don Gunnison for many years, and we've worked together a number of times, and I have a great deal of respect for him. And I, I don't know what his motive is in this presentation, frankly, but I think that there are some important things you need to know to make this a positive experience, not to make it all negative. And I took some notes uh, as he was speaking, and um, I haven't prepared this presentation, so I'll do the best I can from the notes I have. When he began the presentation saying it went off the rail, that was a clue to me. And the clue was that he has his beliefs, he has his understanding, and he was going to make it fit the facts in this case. And I think that was wrong. I mean, second thing. He is a very qualified man, law enforcement officer. He is, and I 